Alhamdulillahi ala kulli hal. We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon every condition. Wa na'udhu billahi min hali ahlin nar. And we seek the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the condition of those who shall be cast into hellfire. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Wassalatu wassalamu ala ashrafil anbiya'i wal mursaleen. Nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa tabi'een wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsanin ila yawmiddin wa ba'd. We send complete blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His entire household, all his companions, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless them all. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless every one of us and to grant us alleviation from the suffering that we may be going through. Each one of us has to be going through some form of hardship and difficulty without exception. There is no exception, not a single exception. We all have to. It's the plan of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be going through some form of hardship or difficulty, the magnitude of which differs, but nobody can be free of hardship, not one. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us. May he make it easy for us to understand why he has chosen for us to go through hardship and to endure. So we ask Allah to bless us all and our offspring, those to come up to the end. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all goodness. Amin. My beloved, beautiful brothers and sisters in Islam. When I say beautiful here, I'm talking of the heart. I'm talking of the fact that we meet warm people with the most beautiful character and conduct. And over and above that, I'm also speaking of how, how handsome and beautiful Allah has made all of us. For some people, the hardship is the way they look. Why? Be proud of your identity. Be happy regarding your complexion. It is your gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some people are depressed. They think they are too dark in complexion. Sometimes they think they are too big or too small, or they think they are too short or too tall. That is something you have actually affected yourself by thinking about it. It's not Allah who actually did anything wrong to you. Not at all. It is you and your perception and the fact that you've allowed the world to have an impact on your thinking that you now think being short is a problem. You now think being dark is a problem. You now think perhaps something that is of your nature, you know, having small nails is a problem. <laughs> Subhanallah. Having hair that might not be straight is a problem or having straight hair, according to some is a problem. These are not hardships. This is not what I am here to talk about this evening. These are sicknesses that people have ingratitude. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. But yes, one might endure when others begin to look at you differently because of where you come from, because of your race, because of your tribe because of perhaps your complexion, then we do agree that you will have to endure and you will have to go through those hardships, whether you like it or not. Question number one, why? My maker is Ghafoorun Rahimun, most forgiving, most merciful. Why did he make us such that we have to endure difficulties and hardship? Why? I need to understand it. It's a question every young man and woman asks if Allah is so merciful. Why does everyone on the globe go through difficulties? Why do we see so much in terms of problem and hardship? Why do we see currencies crashing? Why do we see situations very difficult on the globe? Why do we see weather patterns that are erratic? Why do we see floods? Why do we see so much of hardship? Wallahi, you need to know the answer. Allah says, I created you in order to test you. This is what differentiates a believer from the one who doesn't believe. You don't believe that there was a maker who made you. Perhaps you might have believed something else. Well, you may be free to believe that, but you might pay for that. In what way? You won't understand the plan 
of the Almighty and why we are going through all these difficulties and what's going on and where we will go when we will die because when you get close to death that sickness will be such a great hardship that it will be so depressing and you think let me end my life because you don't have any belief and you think that once I end my life it's over not realizing it's actually only the beginning so when you believe you have a gift what is the gift that gift is you understand the plan of the Almighty, why He made you in the first place. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us ease. So Allah says in the Quran, Surah Al Baqarah. And I will stop there. I just read one verse, sorry, one word of the verse. Allah says, and the lamb. The lamb that starts that verse, there is a wow, which means and. The lamb is actually for emphasis. Allah is saying, and we emphasize to you. We emphasize to you. That's the meaning of just the lamb, right? La. Wala. Then Allah says, nablua. Nablua means we will test. We will test. If Allah wanted, he could have said, nabluakum. That means we will test you. But Allah says, Nabluwannakum. That noon, the double noon, mm, it means definitely, definitely, indeed, we are emphasizing it again and again. Wow. Allah's emphasized it more than once, <laughs> just in that one word, subhanallah. No language has the power of the Arabic language, where a, where a single letter can actually add so much meaning to that word. So Allah says, Wala nabluwann. Indeed, we will definitely test every single one of you. And we are emphasizing that there is no way out. We will have to test you. Why? That's why we made you, to test you. You are here in order to pass through examination after examination. And when you are through with all your exams, you will die and graduate and receive your certificate. How did you do back in your school? That's what it was. This is our school, my brothers and sisters. I cannot dress how I want. I must wear the uniform that the school has decided I should wear. I cannot just eat as and when I wish and what I, will, what I want. There is a place and a time for everything and at the same time, a certain quality and standard of food that I need to eat. The same applies to what I say. I cannot utter the words I want in this beautiful school known as life. I need to utter words that are the most beautiful words. Make sure when you talk to your children, when you talk to your family members, you have the best of words. It's your test. When you graduate, you will see your certificate. If you had bad words, you failed. If you had good words, then Allah looks at everything else. The best of words, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah. I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship besides he who made me. And I bear witness that Muhammad, peace be upon him, is a messenger of Allah who was sent to teach us how to lead our life, to teach us how to worship the Almighty, and to teach us why we are here in the first place. That's the most powerful statement. You repeat that, trust me, your certificate is ready for you. It is waiting on condition that you lead your life in accordance with the, the rules and regulations of this beautiful school. My brothers and sisters, so as you are born, the first hardship that you may face is where you were born. Subhanallah, you might say how? And you might already know, you might have experienced it. What if you were born in a war zone? Was it your fault? No, it was Allah's test. That is evidence enough to prove that your maker decided to test you by making you be born in an area where it was going to be a war zone. Subhanallah, your test, hardship. You were born into hardship as soon as you were born. In fact, when you were conceived, you started hearing sounds. You started hearing sounds of bombing, sounds of shooting, sounds of people screaming and yelling. That is a test, wallahi. It is a powerful test. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for those in that type of a test. Those who are being tested from when they are in the wombs of their mothers. But there is a test that actually goes beyond that one. You know what it is? Allah says, I want to test you 
and I want to give you such a big test and I want to explain before I say this test the hardship right that Allah says subhanahu wa ta'ala through the blessed lips of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that when I test someone it's a sign of my love for them how I'm sure you've heard that it's not wrong to ask how you need to know how there was a time when we were young we used to go to the sheikh or the maulana and say but how he says hey shut up keep quiet sit down you know that's a verse you cannot argue with it so i'm not arguing i want to understand it now as we grew a little bit older we allow the children to ask us any question that crosses their mind no matter how silly someone else might think it is they can if you tell them when allah tests you it's a sign of his love you have the right to say please explain to me how i don't understand it and they will explain to you and you can still say i still don't understand you can you are allowed to say that there will come a point when we say look that's revelation i accept it but i don't really understand subhanallah i'm a believer when i'm a believer i may not really understand every aspect that there is there but i believe that's what believing is all about so Allah says, when I test someone, it's a sign of my love. I tell you one of the reasons why. Inna Allah idha ahabba abdan ibtalah. Muhammad, peace be upon him, says, when Allah loves you, he will test you and you will enjoy the test because you get closer to him. I give you a simple example. So, mashallah, you were born in a beautiful place. Your father was a multimillionaire. You went to the best school. You were pampered. Whatever you wanted to eat, you just had to say it. And it was made for you. You went to school. You had the luxuries, air condition. You were not even allowed to feel the weather outside. Subhanallah. You had the best of clothing. You, drive, you drove a Mercedes every day. Subhanallah. And what happened is, in fact, let me make it a BMW because people might think that yesterday I said Mercedes. Let me change it today. Subhanallah. Okay. So you had a BMW. And what happened is, you carried on, you went to school, you went to the best of schools, you had everything going for you, subhanallah. And what happened to your salah? I know of families, the parents, mashallah, very religious, they wouldn't miss a salah. But here comes the son, the daughter, those parents, because they had it easy going, whatever happened, they sent their children to schools and did the best for them. But they didn't realize we are, we are concerned about ourselves. Here are our children, they are not even fulfilling salah. No salah. So father, mother, when you look at them and you look at the children, it's like from two different families. Subhanallah. Why? Something's gone wrong. When Allah loves those children, there will come a day. You go to the doctor, you get a test and you realize you have cancer. That's the biggest gift that you could have just had at that stage in your life. What happened? Whoa, first thing that crosses your mind, I'm going to die. Cancer. May Allah grant cure to all those who are affected with any disease, be it cancer or AIDS or anything else. I mean, say I mean loudly. So my brothers and sisters, that's a gift. How is it a gift? Allah is tapping you to say, listen, you got the whole world, everything. Start preparing to come back to me. You don't realize your life, very little is left. I love you so much. I want you to do something so that when you come to me, at least I can give you through my mercy a lot. You might say, oh Allah, give it to me without doing anything. Allah might tell you, well, it's not fair on the others who've done so much. Subhanallah. Do something at least. One deed at least. <laughs> Subhanallah. Imagine you suffered your whole life pleasing Allah and here comes a person who's never pleased Allah and he wants Jannah just by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Something might irk you a little bit. So Allah says at least do one deed. You know, no matter what it is, try something. This is why we say when you've done one deed, you know or you may not know how powerful the deed was. Subhanallah. And through that, Allah might give you Jannatul Firdaus. It, he has the capacity of giving paradise to you without even that deed. But here we're talking about the mercy of Allah. While you're alive, you had forgotten the existence of your maker. His commands meant nothing to you. His instruction and everything to do with the school that I spoke about a few moments ago had nothing to do with you. You were leading a life outside of that box. So Allah tapped you out of his love. Come back. What happened? As soon as you got back from the doctor, 
or while you were at the doctor, you said, Astaghfirullah, oh Allah, cure me. Subhanallah, Rabbil Alameen. First time in your life, you're calling out to Allah hardship. Allah says, we will help you go through the hardship. Don't worry. The best way to go through that hardship is to believe in me. I am the most powerful. I'm your maker. I made you in the first place. Guess what? You're going to return to me. Just focus on that. It will help you go through your suffering. So any one of us suffering in any way, first thing, focus on your maker. Turn to your maker. Re develop your link with your maker. It will help you ease the suffering. Surviving hardship will happen when the one who put that hardship in your life has, is close to you because you have developed a link with him. Subhanallah. So when I go through hardship difficulty, point number one, I turn to Allah and guess in what way? I start off by saying, Astaghfirullah. Oh Allah, forgive me. Maybe I might just have done something bad and wrong that now I'm being tested. It's possible. It's not always the case, but it's possible. But Allah says as a gift to you, we want you to know when you seek forgiveness, when you seek forgiveness from us, we will automatically help you go through your hardship. You will survive the hardship. You might ask how? Go back to what Nuh alayhi salatu was salam told his people. قُلْ تُسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفَّارًا I told my people, seek forgiveness. Allah is most forgiving. يُرْسِلِ السَّمَاءَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِدْرَارًا As a result of that seeking of forgiveness and achievement of forgiveness, He will send rain from the heavens in the right proportion for you. And it will result in the flourishing of your economy because you sought forgiveness. When you continue sinning, you continue deserving the wrath. But Allah says, hang on, I will still give you through my mercy. But if you really want my mercy, you just need to seek forgiveness. That's all. I will give it to you. Keep on seeking forgiveness. Don't say I sought forgiveness yesterday. Why should I do it today? Seeking forgiveness from your maker is different from seeking forgiveness from a fellow human being. You seek it even if you haven't committed a sin because Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sought it up to a hundred times a day. He didn't need it, but it elevated his status every single time he asked Allah's forgiveness. How many times do we seek forgiveness? Then we want to survive the hardships that we are going through. Noah, Nuh alayhi salatu was salam. May peace be on him. He tells his people as a result of you saying Astaghfirullah, asking Allah's forgiveness, he will send rain for you. He will improve your condition. And he will increase your wealth. We have financial hardship. How do I survive it? Number one, seek Allah's forgiveness. He will increase your wealth. He will give you more. You want more money? Turn to Allah in forgiveness, in repentance. Guess what? He owns the wealth that you are seeking. He's the owner. I am surprised by people who are requesting for the world from someone who doesn't own it. Allahu Akbar. You are asking for money from a person who doesn't really own the money. You are asking for sustenance from one who does not own the sustenance. You want cure from someone who doesn't own the cure. Go to your maker. He is the owner of your sustenance, the owner of cure, the owner of your whole life. Subhanallah. So to survive hardship, develop a link with your maker. It has to be. There's no way out. You have to. Otherwise that hardship becomes a double hardship. Look at those who believe in Allah. How? Allah didn't promise them they will not say, face hardship. Allah says, I will help you through. Amazing are the affairs of a true believer. For indeed, all his or her affairs are good for him or her. In asabathu sarra'u shakara fakana khayr Allah. When something good happens, a believer is thankful. So it's better for him or her. وَإِنْ أَصَابَتْهُ ضَرَّاءُ صَبَرَ فَكَانَ خَيْرَ اللَّهِ And when hardship affects 
him or her, meaning a believing male or female, then he or she bears sabr. Sabr means to endure, to be patient, to restrain yourself, to be patient. So he or she is patient, but still happy with Allah's decree. So it's better for him or her. So here comes the man. He was diagnosed cancer. He turns to Allah that evening. He reads Salatul Isha for the first time in his life. And he cries and he weeps. The doctor told him you have two months to, lay, to live. It is stage four. May Allah grant cure to all those who are sick and ill. Amen. What happened? He turned to Allah. He cried to Allah. Oh Allah, cure me. Now there are two things that can happen. Either Allah will cure him or Allah will not cure him. If Allah did not cure him, it was still the biggest gift because his last days in the world, he was so close to Allah. Allah says, I love you. Look at this condition. You are crying for me. You are getting close to me. You are worshipping me alone. You are seeking forgiveness for all the sins you committed in the past. And you don't know there are only two weeks for you to live. But look how I brought you to me. Look how I brought you to me. You came to me. Is it not a gift? When you die after that and you started getting close to Allah two weeks before you died, the hadith speaks about how you are judged according to how you were when you died at the end. A football match is only finished at 90 minutes or after the overtime. The score is only confirmed when the final whistle is blown. In the middle, anything can happen. I've watched a match once where one of the teams had scored three goals and the other one had zero. And it ended 4-3 to the opposition. And the people were so excited. You know, football is no longer about the players and all of that. It's about the fans. It's about the fans. They get more excited than the players themselves. Maybe the players might have a bit more money. You know, it, it amazes me how some of the richest people in the world are those who can just kick a ball. That's it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. I met a young boy. I asked him, son, and I like to do this. What do you want to become? Football. I said, football? Okay, okay. Why? He says, my father said there is a lot of money and you don't need to go to school. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Even the fathers are wondering if my son can kick a ball, I am set. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. That's how some other people survive their hardship. <laughs> By encouraging their children to go into life in such a way that it might create ease for them. Not realizing that yes, you know, I'm not attacking football or anything, but I am saying my brothers and sisters, there are lessons for us to learn even in football. If the game has a beginning and an end, your life also has a beginning and an end. If that game, the aim of each person is to try for the entire 90 minutes to score a goal, then in your life for the entire 90 years, you need to score as many goals as possible. If even if the opposition is weak and you've already scored 10-0, it is better for you to score 20-0, 50-0 and break history. Break it. You know, I know of a match and I'm not mentioning the names of the teams because I don't want to embarrass people. But I know of a match. It was a World Cup match. There was an embarrassing result. And this team kept on scoring like there was no one on the other side. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. But the lesson for me is when shaitan comes to attack me, I need to keep defending. I need to keep going through shaitan's defense. And scoring my goal, one after the other, another after the third and fourth and so on. And that's how I will survive the hardships. I look forward to worshipping Allah. You look forward to the next salah with happiness. Allah will make it easy for you. Whatever you've gone through is become simple. Because your link with Allah is powerful. So Allah says, when I love you, I test you. Look how. I love you so much and I noticed that you were very far from me and I knew you were dying in two weeks time. So I wanted to bring you close to me before you die so that you don't lose the hereafter because you had the whole world. You had everything in this world. We spoke about it, didn't we? Then I want to give you the hereafter as well because you had a good heart. You were a good person. So I brought you closer to me two weeks before. 
two months before, two years before. And I let you go through hardship for a short space of time. Subhanallah. Now do you understand? That Allah loves you. When Allah loves you, He tests you. You say, but you love me. Why do you test me? No, when He loves you, He tests you. Because by testing you, He actually brings you closer to Him. If you have belief, you don't question Him. You become closer to Him. That's belief. But when you are dilly-dallying in belief, then you become further away and more despondent. You become further away from Allah when you're tested. What? I have a disease? Who did it? Well, if you're going to say Allah did it and you don't understand why, it's going to drive you further away. And if it drives you further away, He has lost this world and the next. And that is indeed a clear loss. So don't do that. My brothers and sisters, I was saying worse than being born in a war zone is when Allah has chosen for you that you will be born into this world with some challenge in the form of disability. So you're born and you did not see from day one. That is a hardship. And Allah says that hardship is not only for you. But we want to give the opportunity to those around you to earn their paradise through serving you. Wow. So, a person was born, they couldn't see. A child was born, cerebral palsy. A child was born perhaps without an organ. A child was born perhaps some form of deformity. The test is for the parents and for those around and the community and the philanthropists. The test is for them. Are you going to rise to the occasion? Are you going to help another of your kind? You've only got one more year to live. Let's see what you're going to do for this child that you witnessed and you saw. I remember a wealthy man. Again, I know him, but without names was watching a television channel and in Niger he saw people he saw a specific child a specific child eating the sand out of hunger and this man was a multi-millionaire perhaps into the billions and he decided I want to find out who this is and I want to do something about these people. And wallahi, I'm not joking. He got hold of the channel. It was a Western channel. It was CNN. He got hold of whoever. He found out from his own people who are around him where that was. He got hold of people there. He found the exact location and he located the person. It took him a bit of time. He decided to build a school, to drill boreholes, to make roads, to do whatever he had to. I don't know about the roads, but I know he built a school and he gave them food and he taught them things and he did clothing for them and whatever else. He changed the whole community. And guess what? A few months later, he passed away of cancer. The same man. May Allah grant him Jannatul Firdaus. What prodded him to do this? He was flicking the channels. He was flicking the channels. He saw someone going through hardship. He felt it. He did not know them. He did not know who they were. He just knew they were human beings. They were suffering. This is a Muslim man. And he decided, I've got all the money in the world. What am I going to do? I've got all the money in the world. What am I going to do? Let me help these people. Later on, they found out that he did it for many, many communities. Subhanallah. That is how he spent his money. How have you spent your money? And we sit and we busy bad mouth the same people without even knowing the good they've done. We had floods here in Sri Lanka some time back. Mashallah. The best thing that could have happened, happened. What was it? 
people rose to the occasion. It was such a blessing to see Muslims go to assist non-Muslims. Amazing. That's your opportunity. Amazing. To show that you are human beings. And it happened. People were talking about it across the globe. Did you hear what happened in Sri Lanka? Well, the Muslims got up and helped those perhaps who didn't even like them. You know, the media portrays such a bad image of Islam and the Muslims that sometimes the non-Muslims think we are evil people, not realizing that 99.99% of us are actually lovely people who care for humanity at large. So there it was. How did they go through their suffering? Allah created you. Not to sit back and watch. You're drowning. Let me quickly take a photo. I can put it on Instagram. I witnessed the drowning. Throw your phone away, my brother. Throw it away. Dive in and save the person. A long time back when people screamed, help, everyone ran. Today when people scream, help, everyone runs. But the difference is, before they ran towards the person, today they run towards their phones. May Allah forgive us. First, I need my phone. Take it out. Let's see what's going on. Okay, help. Wait, I'm coming. But let me take the... The person's dead by the time. Throw your phone away. Surviving hardship. How did they survive the hardship? I tell you, by everyone reaching out to them. The day you have such a hardship, I promise you, they will reach out to you. When we go through collective hardship, all the barriers drop. You become a human being. That's it. I'm a human being. When people are drowning or there is an earthquake or some, someone is suffering somewhere, nobody looks at, hey brother, sorry, tell me, what faith do you belong to before I save you? Nobody's ever asked that. People rush to assist. They help. I recall times when I have stopped my vehicle on the road when I noticed people with a puncture or people whose vehicle has broken down and I have stopped I don't need to tell them who I am I don't need to give them any other detail and I've helped them without them knowing who it was and they just look at you and they're just so shocked because they see someone dressed in white with a big beard and so on and subhanallah you get you roll your sleeves and you start working forget about dirtying your clothing if you think my clothing is going to be messed, your humanity can leave you sometimes. You forget about everything. Dive in straight. Your clothes, no, whatever it is. You don't have to wait. Hey, I, I will dive in, but I need a swimming costume. Let me go to the market and buy it. Jump in straight there. But by all means, don't just remove all your clothing before you jump in. <laughs> so when you help others survive their hardship, the day you have a hardship, trust me, they will come in your direction by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So congratulations to you, the Muslims of Sri Lanka. When the floods came in, the whole world heard about how you reached out to the Buddhists and to the others who were not even Muslim. I heard with these ears how poor Muslims riding bikes had actually gone to make donations of whatever they could scratch together and give it to say, listen, this is from us. For who? These people. Wow. The Buddhists bear witness that the Muslims helped. What a great teaching of Islam and what a beautiful teaching of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You have revived and shone as an example for the rest of the world. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. And I really hope that if anything were to happen to us one day, we would also have everyone come to our assistance because that is how we survive hardship. Don't think that you can survive alone. You cannot. Number one, you need Allah. Number two, don't forget to be virtuous to one another. Allah created you interdependent. For your bread, you need the baker. For your milk, you need the farmer. Or you need to go to the dairy. And so on. These are simple examples. When you get sick, you need the doctor. He will help you by the will of Allah. 
to go through your hardship. What's the hardship? I have an ailment, a sickness. I have a cough. My throat is sore. Subhanallah. Alone, what could happen? You had to do something. You had to go to the shop. You had to buy. You, so when you have a good relationship with others, it will help you the day you are going through your hardship. So to survive your hardship in advance, have a good relationship with people. What tawaddudu ilan nas in isful aql. Being loving and kind to all human beings is actually half of intellect. That's what it is. It's half of what? Half of intellect. Because the day you go through hardship, trust me, you will be like a king. The whole world will come because you've helped everyone. You've helped everyone. So this is the gift of Allah. Survival through hardship. In advance, when you have a relationship with Allah, the day you go through difficulty, Allah will rush towards you. Ta'arraf ila Allahi fi rakhai ya'rifka fi shiddati. Get close to Allah. Become acquainted with Allah during days of ease. Do you know what that means? When you had the money, you had the position, you had everything, you were young, you were good looking, you had everything, then get acquainted with Allah. Because the day that you are going through hardship, known as a shidda, shidda means hardship, difficulty, Allah will get acquainted with you. Allah will come to you. Allah will rush towards you. And you'll be a happy person. My brother, Mahmoud, may Allah grant him cure in Dubai. He's not well. He has been paralyzed for many years, over a decade. He cannot speak. He communicates with his eyes. Each time I go to Dubai, I try to visit him. It is a test, subhanallah, for everyone. Those around him and himself as well. But guess what? Wallahi, he told me, if you think that I'm not a happy man, you are wrong. If you think I'm not content with the decree of Allah and with what Allah has chosen for me, you are wrong. I'm the happiest man in the world. Wallahi. Those are the people. May Allah grant them Jannatul Firdaus. May Allah ease the suffering of their family members. And may Allah help me to learn a lesson from such a great man. Such a great man. Someone who inspires me. And may we all be inspired by this example. Those are hardships. But Allah creates, Allah sprinkles goodness through that. Imagine a person who's born from birth. They haven't seen. I remember a young boy. I told him, can I offer you a banana? He said, yes, he couldn't see. And guess what? I realized, I said, you've never seen a banana. He says, no, but I know what it's all about. I said, okay. I said, what color is it? He said, yellow. Banana yellow. Yes, it was yellow. So I was happy. I said, oh, mashallah, you guys are quite advanced. You see, when you have a problem, if you keep on thinking, I have a problem. Say you're losing your eyesight. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant or restore the eyesight of those who've lost their eyesight or those who are losing their eyesight. Amen. If you start thinking, oh, I'm losing my eyesight, it's going, and you know, I can't see, and I, what's going to happen, and so on, you become depressed. And it's not going to restore your eyesight by worrying about it. But if you start thinking, oh, Allah, cure me, and I'm going to try the medication, and I'm going to do everything, but in the meantime, I'm going to learn Braille, I'm going to go forward, I'm going to try my best to start doing things as a person who perhaps might not be able to see very soon, and then you, you pluck up the courage and you go, Wallahi, you can achieve much more than those who are sighted. Possible. One example. How did you go through it? Help of Allah. Courage. Be strong. Don't be weak. Do not pity yourself. No, because the world is not going to pity you. Don't pity yourself. Oh, you know what? I lost my leg. I lost my leg. What a big hardship. I agree. It's a big hardship. I'm not saying no. But the, for as long as you carry on thinking that I lost my leg. Now what am I going to do? I'm depressed. I'm sitting at home. The, for as long as you are thinking that, you are not going to be helped. 
you went through a divorce, very big hardship. Sometimes for no reason, a man will come. He met a girl in the nightclub and he comes home and he says, I divorce you because you know what? I met Susan. Well, to hell with him and his Susie. <laughs> Allah saved you from something bigger. Pick yourself up, stop pitying yourself and stop wanting to harm him. It's over. Allah will deal with him for as long as you want to pay back and revenge and retaliate. You're harming yourself. You're not going to survive that hardship. It's going to affect you. So to survive that type of a hardship, get on with life, get up and move. Forget about that. That was a dirty episode, a bad episode. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us, guide us. So you need to get up and move on. And guess what? Perhaps Abdullahi will marry you. MashaAllah. And what happened after that? You think to yourself, Oh Allah, I thank you that I went through this divorce. Because had I not gone through the divorce, I wouldn't have married such an honorable man. Flawless. Flawless meaning in the eyes of human beings sometimes. I know of many cases. Today, I spoke to someone. Today. And this person was telling me, Wallahi, my first marriage, before my first marriage, I used to make dua. Oh Allah, give me a husband like this, like this, like this, like this, like this. And so many things, I had a list. And I got married and I had the worst condition. And I tried and tried my best, but it ended in divorce. And after divorce, I went through hardship because there is stigma of the family and stigma of the others and the people because you have a child, they are pulling tug of war and so on. And it is very difficult, so hard. And I kept on making dua to Allah. Oh Allah, I know you have a plan for me. I know there is something. And I kept on trying. Now some people, they go through one divorce and that's it. You know what? I'm not going to get married again because men are bad or women are bad. No way. I mean, you're trying to tell me I'm bad. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. <laughs> They are beautiful people, lovely souls. There are so many. And then she told me today, she says, Wallahi, I want you to know that I married again. And it was a miracle of Allah. Every dua I made was answered. Amazing. And you know what I said? Allah wanted you to appreciate the man he had always chosen for you by making you go through someone who was not a good person for you to know what good and bad is all about. You don't know heat. You don't know what hot is, right? Until you know what is cold, subhanallah. And you don't know cold and cool until you know what is hot, subhanallah. No, sorry, I'm talking of heat. I'm not talking of hot as in hot, you know. So the hardships, the difficulties you are going to go through, Allah makes you go through difficulties so you can recognize ease. And this is why, wallahi, powerful means of survival of hardship is when the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa says, no matter what you are going through or you have, unzuru ila man huwa dunakum. Look at those who are worse than you. You lost your husband, he passed away in a car crash. Or you lost your wife, he passed away, she passed away in a car crash or sickness or illness, so on and so forth. Murder, armed robbery, it happens in many countries where so unsafe people come in and begin to shoot and people lose their lives. And guess what? Look at someone who lost not only the husband, but three children together with the husband. And they're still surviving. Yes, you have times when you will break down, you start crying. Crying is a means, a very healthy way of surviving your hardship. It's not wrong to cry. Cry. It's natural. It's human nature. Even the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam shed a tear when Ibrahim, his son, was in his hands, passed away. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum asked him, Ya Rasulallah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what is this? You know, meaning you're, you're supposed to be strong. He answered this hadith is in Sahih al-Bukhari. A beautiful response. He says, Innama hiya rahmatun ja'alaha Allahu fi ibadihi ruhama 
This is indeed mercy that Allah has put in the hearts of those who are merciful. You feel you lost your child. Subhanallah, may Allah grant that child goodness, but may Allah make the child a means of your entry into paradise. How? Because you will bear patience. When you bore the patience, Allah rewarded you. Indeed, we grant those who bear patience a reward without a limit, unlimited reward. You lost your child, you were patient. You cried a bit sometimes. You missed your child once in a while. And as time passed, obviously it faded a little bit because Allah creates occasions and Allah creates things that you will go through that make you forget about a difficulty you were in in the past. You went through a difficult divorce, but now you're married so happily, you forgot about what happened there. So when you lost the child or you lost someone and you bore the patience and you then met with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after you passed away, Allah tells you, do you know what? You bore so much of patience. You were happy with my decree. That means you believed I was God Almighty. Allahu Akbar. It's a sign of belief. This is why in Islam, in your declaration of Iman, Allah has kept in it a clause that will help you survive your hardship. What is the clause? Good and bad fate, I declare and I believe it is from Allah alone. What does that mean? When something good happens, I declare it's from Allah. When something bad happens, I declare it's from Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. In order for us to be able to go through or to survive the hardship. That's why Allah kept one of the clauses of belief, one of the tenets that I declare, I believe in fate, taqdeer, I believe it. Once you say, oh Allah, you took my child away or you took my leg away or you took something away from me or you did this to me, oh Allah, but I surrender to your decree and help me to be patient, help me overcome it, replace it for me with something better. The Prophet ﷺ, when something bad used to happen, he used to say, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Indeed, we belong to Allah. We are going to all return to him. There can be nothing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept everlasting on this earth. And then the Prophet ﷺ taught us to say, Allahumma ajirni fi musibati, O oh Allah. You know, one is you are asking for the help of Allah. You are asking for a recompense, a reward from Allah, recompense from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Help to go through the difficulty and the hardship, O oh Allah. Grant me that and wakhlufli khayram min. Oh, minha. oh Allah, grant me in return something better than what you took away. Something better than what you took away. These are supplications. There are so many supplications that will help you survive your hardship. Many supplications, learn them. And go and see the stories of others. I mentioned moments ago, look at those who are worse than you. Take a look at people who were born in refugee camps. Today they are 11 years old, 12 years old. Take a look at those whose weddings happened in refugee camps. Take a look at those, subhanallah, who gave birth while they were fleeing bombing and so many other things. We have tasted zero compared to them. They are going through hardship. May Allah make it easy for them. And that brings me to another point. To survive your hardship, pray for others who are going through hardship. Feel for others and it will help you. Because when you raise your hands and you say, Oh Allah, help the suffering brothers and sisters in Syria, those who have lost their homes in Iraq, in Afghanistan, those who are suffering in Bangladesh, in Burma, those who are struggling in Sudan or in Somalia, wherever else it may be, those who are struggling in any country and you really think about them and you really raise your hands and pray for them. You don't need to put up a status on Facebook about it. You don't. That's not a requirement of Allah and His Rasul. The world does not need to know what you've done about the people suffering across the globe. 
I always get this. People say, Shaykh, why are you so quiet about what's happening in the world? Show me a verse of the Quran that tells me that I need to put up a status on Facebook. Show me a, a hadith that tells me that I need to use Twitter to tell the world what I, what I think. No, people are doing a lot of that. There are some people who are activists. Let them do all of that. Not everyone needs to specialize in the same thing, but everyone needs to do something about it. You have to. What I did, you don't need to know. In fact, I should hide it from you. That's the sunnah. And I may not be able to do what you've done, but guess what? I may have just done something you cannot do. Subhanallah. In fact, sometimes it becomes more of a hardship. Now I'm not talking of a global level. I'm talking of personal hardship. It becomes more of a hardship when you advertise what you're going through. Hey, I have a toothache and you put it on Facebook and you take a picture of your tooth ah, and you put it on Instagram. I have a toothache. Can you see what's going on? That's not going to help you go through hardship. Wallahi, it will create a greater headache. You only had a toothache. Now you have a headache because your husband saw someone commenting nice teeth. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. So you need to think of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's way. I said, learn the supplications. Look at those who are struggling more. When you make dua for them, the angels actually make dua for you. If I say, oh Allah, help those who are suffering, the angels say, and oh Allah, help this person as well. Subhanallah. They don't know me. I don't know them. I pray for all of them. All of them. And wherever I can reach out, I will reach out. And whenever I can help people, I can... Help people what, in whatever way I can. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive those who think that we don't do anything about the people suffering across the globe. May Allah forgive their short-sightedness. And when I say we, I'm not talking of me alone, all of us. Because sometimes one dua can be more powerful than anything else you could have given the person. Don't underestimate it. I know someone who gets up at the time of tahajjud, especially to make dua for people suffering across the globe only. That's their contribution, perhaps. That's their way of doing things, perhaps. That might be single-handedly more powerful than a lot of what others are doing could be. And they told me that they overheard someone say that dua does nothing for you. Dua does nothing for you. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. How weak is your iman? We are not saying only do dua, but sometimes that's the best gift you can give them. I'm helpless to do anything else. For example, we are taught when you are sick, you cannot just make dua and sit back at home. We agree. Your sickness. Because you can in your capacity do something about it by visiting the doctor, by having some honey, by for example, you know, having hot water with lemon and ginger and something else. Everyone will tell you so many things or getting a course of medication, whatever it is. But you did something and you still rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What you did may or may not cure you. It may. But together with that, you make a dua. But sometimes nothing's happening. Everyone's trying. The doctors have told you, you know what? There's nothing we can do about it. You've got a little time to survive, to live. And so... You keep on making dua and that's about the only thing you can now do. Have hope in the mercy of Allah. I tell people who are terminally ill. Number one, make dua that Allah grant you a miracle, miraculous cure to start with. And make dua that Allah has mercy upon you. Because if he has decided to take you away, go with a smile. We all have to go. I have to go. You have to go. So if it's a terminal illness and you're situation is deteriorating there is a brother here subhanallah who sometimes i i think about i think about him quite often 
And I always make a dua, O oh Allah, grant him Jannatul Firdaus. O oh Allah, grant him cure through your mercy. In my heart, I know, subhanAllah, it's Allah's mercy. If he wants, he will cure. If he doesn't, what happens? Well, if he gives you Jannatul Firdaus, you have succeeded. I always ask a question and I want to ask you today again. I want to ask all of you this question. If the angel of death came right now and told you, now you know who you are, you know your money, you know your wealth, you know your family, you know everything. If the angel of death came right now to you and told you, listen, we take you away right now and Allah gives you Jannah. Who would say, okay, take me? Alhamdulillah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. Wow, I'm impressed. I tell you why. Because it goes to show that the main aim is actually Jannatul Firdaus. Your wife, don't worry. She'll be taken care of by the guy who always wanted to marry her. You did not expect that, right? <laughs> okay, let's reword that. <laughs> she will be taken care of. Your children will be taken care of. There are others who have already gone at a younger age than you, leaving prettier wives than yours. And they were taken care of properly by the people. Mashallah, they rose to the occasion, haven't they? Their children became successful businessmen. Perhaps the only problem in this life for all of them is you. So maybe you should go. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy. Getting a bit more serious. The difficulty is we don't understand that sometimes Allah takes someone away at a specific point because he knows if they die at that point, I will give them Jannatul Firdaus. I will give them paradise. So Allah took him away, 29 years old, gone. Don't worry, he's gone to a better place. Allah will take you when he knows it is the right time for you to go, which is already predestined. It's done. It's amazing. We go through so many difficulties and hardship in our lives. But we smile. Allah creates ease with every difficulty. Sometimes you're going through something stressful. A person in your business and they've done this to you and that to you. Someone stole and you go home and you see your daughter smiling at you. Smiling at you. What happened? Allah gave you a gift to forget about your problem for a while. But don't ever think that the bottle will help you forget your problems. Because the bottle itself is a bigger problem. It is a greater hardship. I met a man in Zimbabwe who was drinking so much. And I told him, my brother, why are you drinking? No, I need to forget my problems. <laughs> he spoke exactly like that. Uh, 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 you know, so I, I told him, but for how long? He says, well, even if it's for one night. So I said, when you wake up, he says, well, the problems come back. So what do you do? I drink again. <laughs> <laughs> that means the problem is not solved. Now he's addicted. He's losing his family, losing everyone around him. There are more problems. So don't ever think that an intoxicant will help you through your problems because wallahi it will not. I swear by Allah, intoxicants will never help you. They will actually compound the problem, make it worse. So what do you do? You turn to Allah, sit on the sajada, sit on that prayer mat and cry to Allah. Clean yourself and cry to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's healthy. Draw closer to Allah. Perhaps it's the first time you actually did that and you feel so good when you get up. Half your problem is solved. Then to survive your hardship, be careful. Like I said, you don't have to place it on Facebook or Instagram. You also don't have to tell the whole world, you know, this is what happened. You know, that's what happened. You don't have to say it. You need to know the close circle that Allah has bestowed you with and some confidants, some people who are close to you, whom you trust. You can tell them. I mean, I was walking with three people and highly respected people. And I remember a man 
coming up and asking one of them, how's your wife? No, 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 I heard she had a miscarriage. No, she put it on Facebook. <laughs> oh, wow. Imagine the embarrassment of a man. His wife told the whole world on Facebook, I had a miscarriage. A poor man, he was walking with me. I promise you with me. I felt embarrassed for him. <laughs> I felt embarrassed for him. Guess what he told me after that? Do me a favor. Can you please speak about this, one of your talks? So anyway, brother, I spoke about it. <laughs> may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy. He means educate everyone to say, and I agree. You need to know what you can release in the public domain. Social media is powerful and it is very, very delicate at the same time. It has in it a lot of dangerous spots. Dangerous spots. You put something and you don't know how far and wide it's gone. You don't know how people have abused your image. You don't know what they've done. May Allah forgive us. I know of another case of a hardship created out of a face that one girl put on the social media. A wise crack took that face and he photoshopped a naked body under the face. And then he sent it to X, Y and Z and they all thought they had the naked image of this young girl, innocent girl. And if you want to know how that ended, it was terrible. Because he started demanding money, he started doing things, and this girl sought the help of her father. And this brings me to something. When people are trying to blackmail you, seek the help of your parents. I'm talking to the young people. Don't ever think I need to pay him the money. So what? You don't. You don't need to pay anyone any money. Don't allow yourself to be blackmailed. Seek the help of your parents and my beloved parents. If your children come to you in a scenario like that, even if they have out of the devil's trap sent their own nude images to people, learn to help them out of it. Learn to help because it is happening on the globe. That's why we're talking about it today. You help them survive their hardship. Allah will help you through something else. How could you do this? How could you send a nude image to someone? Dad, I made a mistake. May Allah forgive us. Watch out. Those nude images go very far. Very far. Everyone is watching them. They are paying to watch you. And you thought you were having a nude phone call with some guy or some girl somewhere in the States or somewhere in any other country. They are dirty people. They are people who are actually maniacs across the globe, subhanallah, scattered all over, who are waiting to make money out of this type of behavior. It's a hardship. It's the times we're living in. As parents, we need to rise to the occasion, help them so that no one makes money through your kid's mistake. And don't even believe if someone were to tell you, I have the nude image of X, Y, or Z. No, a lot of the times, 90% or more of the times, it's photoshopped. On my little phone I have here, I was taught how to photoshop in such a way that the pic looks more original than the original. And then you have the experts, you know, one of my sons, he can look at it and say, this is Photoshop. You tell him how, and he shows you how. He actually shows, look, this is not what it is. You know, we saw a supermoon recently. So a lot of the images were true because we saw it. But some people were trying to create images to become public or to become famous, to put in the public. And immediately the son of mine says, this is Photoshop. How? Come, let's zoom in and look at the rings around this, this moon here. See what's going on. Check, this is straight. They can tell, but I can't. I'm not an expert in it. I look at it and I think, wow, subhanallah, look at the creation of Allah, you know? Well, look at the creation of Allah. He's created, a, you know, he's helped people create a phone and now they've created Photoshop. So you are saying, wow, subhanallah, but you are saying it to how powerful the Photoshop is. <laughs> May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. So the difficulties we go through, the hardship we face, get close to Allah, pray to Allah, pray for others. Look at those who are worse than you. Never look at those above you because that itself is a hardship. You won't survive it. You have a problem. Let me give you some of the hardships people face today. Financial hardship. 
very difficult. The world is actually like a, a whole ship that is rocking at the moment. You don't know which way it's going to sway next. You have your money. While you're holding it, it's losing value. Imagine what type of a robbery that is. I'm holding it. It's in my hand, but it's going. I hold it tight. I sleep with it under my pillow. When I get up in the morning, it's half its value. What happened? Well, it's a hardship. How do I go through this? Usually financial hardship, we tell people to adjust their lifestyle because a lot of the times we are buying things we don't need. We are spending money based on what we used to have in terms of finance. Now we don't have that. So don't have the same buying habits. Call your family together and tell them, look, we are going through a little bit of hardship. We will have to remove you from that school because we cannot afford the fees. Be honest. It will help you survive. We cannot afford the fee anymore. So I'm going to take you out and we're going to put you into another school. Explain to them. If you don't want to tell your children that because you're too embarrassed, don't. But tell your spouse, explain to them and convince them somehow that we're going to take you out of the school and put you in another place. Sell the product to them. But you have to downgrade your life. It will help you through your hardship. If you don't and if you want to live on credit and you go to the banks and get the loans, that itself is a hardship. We won't be able to help you for that one because Allah told you not to do that. And you, you know, I know of people who have weddings. Their weddings are so big and everyone says, wow, and the whole of Instagram is talking about it. And it becomes, you know, the images are used for wallpaper across the computers of the globe. The marriage is broken within two months. No one spoke about that. But the poor father is paying two years later the bank loan that he took to have the, mar the marriage. Let's hope he could show his face on Instagram after all of that. Who told you to take a massive loan in order to have a, a, a marriage, a wedding? Why? Be a Muslim. Have a simple wedding in the masjid and distribute a few dates and it's over. You couldn't afford it. You are forgiven. It's over. What is my walima? Well, myself, my family members, my brothers and their families, we sat together for a meal. That was my walima. So what? What was the mahar? It was a basic amount. Alhamdulillah. Baraka. Allah helps you. You will survive. You will go through. You lead a happy life. It's not all about figures. It's not all about figures. May Allah make it easy for us. Whenever Allah has spoken about alleviating the suffering of people, he's never spoken about giving them money in order to solve their problems. Not once. He's spoken about giving them contentment, making them happy with what they have been given. But we've become materialistic. The whole globe runs behind the latest, the latest. It becomes such a bad habit, such a bad habit. The handbags must be the latest. The shoes must be the latest. The perfumes must be the latest. The car must be the latest. The phones must be the latest. The bathrooms and kitchens must be the latest. Everything must be the latest such that the day you don't have that level of finance, you are suicidal, let alone depressed. So one of the ways of helping yourself through financial hardship is by adjusting your life and don't be embarrassed to do that because you will be a role model to others. Role model. This is why we are taught that when you are wealthy, when you have position, be humble. One day it might go. If you were close to the ground, when you fall, you don't really get hurt. You stand up and you just walk again. But when you're flying in the sky and you fall, your balloon popped, Allahu Akbar, what happened? You came crashing down and as you fell, you broke all your bones. It was embarrassing. Now I can't even get up. That's why when you have it, you have the fame, you have the name, you have the wealth, you have, humble yourself, still greet the people, talk to them, be okay with them, you know, try and help as much as you can, smile, go to the masjid, read in the first saf or whatever else, be a man. I know of some extremely wealthy people who wouldn't miss a salah. I know of a brother who would not miss an adhan. Adhan. That means he's in the masjid prior to the adhan. Gone. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us.
So these are just some points that I've made mention of regarding hardship and surviving hardship. I said people go through this hardship of finance, financial issues, matters. We spoke about health matters. We spoke about divorce. We spoke about natural disasters. We spoke about various other things, deformity. Then there are those whose hardship is that Allah has not bestowed upon them children. So you're married one year, two years, three years, five years, 10 years. You still don't have children. Allah has a reason. Believe in that. Allah's reason is bigger than whatever you can imagine. He is favoring you. He is favoring you. How? That's what we want to know. I want children. I'm not getting them. You are telling me it's a favor of Allah. Well, what if you had a child who grew up to be a person who was a total burden and he was a drug addict and a person who was in the clubs and he was the one pinching all your electronic gadgets and selling them in order to buy his drugs. It's happening. And the day comes when you said, oh Allah, I wish I didn't even have this child. So Allah says, you know what? We love you enough. We don't even want you to go through something. What if you had a child? And I'm going to say this. It's a hardship. It's gruesome. It's difficult to hear. But let's listen to it. What if you had a child and at a tender age, the child was crushed under a truck? May Allah not do that to us. It has happened to some. Imagine the type of hardship they went through. Allah will only let someone who will be able to go through such hardship, go through that hardship. Because he says, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. Allah does not test or burden someone with something more than they can manage, they can handle. That's your limit. Well, it's your limit. You're still there. So Allah says, we knew that you would go through this difficulty and so on. So we did not give you the child in the first place. It's a blessing. So now you sit and you start worrying. You know, I'm already 48, 50 years old. I don't have children. It's just me and my husband. What's going to happen when he dies or I'm alone and you know, no one's going to be taking care of me. And what's going to happen? I know that other auntie there, you know, she was old and aged. They didn't have children. And then when the husband died, look at what happened to her. All this is unnecessary tension. Unnecessary tension. Because Allah created you. He has a plan for you. He knows what the plan is. So lay your trust in him. He has that plan. In your capacity, whatever you have, you can try. Some people might say, okay, I'm going to look for a beautiful old age home where we can register or perhaps where I can go and retire. Well, that's your plan. If you want to start doing it from now, there's no harm. But so long as you're not depressed in the process, you're just planning. Or I'm going to make amends. I'm going to try and speak to this person, a sister of mine, someone else to say, look, when this happens, that's what I'm going to do. Or I'm going to get a helper to come and live with me if I'm all alone. I'm talking of real hardships. It is a concern, but it must not be a point of depression. It must not be. You must trust Allah enough for it not to become a point of depression. I'm depressed. Because of this, Allah knows he has a plan for you. Don't worry. That plan might include a little bit of difficulty and hardship. But then again, he wants to give you Jannatul Firdaus. If you take a look at Surah Al-Kahf, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about the story of Musa alayhi salam and Al-Khidr. There was a young man that they saw. And you know what? Al-Khidr comes and executes him. And Musa alayhi salam says, how could you execute this man? I'm sure you've probably read the story a lot of you surah al-kahf so he says as for this young man wa amma al-ghulam fa kana abawahu mu'minayn fa khashina fa khashina an yurhiquhuma tughyanan wa kufra فَأَرَدْنَا أَنْ يُبْدِلَهُمَا رَبُّهُمَا خَيْرًا مِّنْهُ زَكَاةً وَأَقْرَبَ رُحْمًا 
Allah says, as for the young boy, Khidr is telling Musa alayhi salam, he has his parents and he's young. Perhaps when he grew older, he would have grown older in total disobedience and disbelief and a lot of hardship and difficulty would have come to burden his parents. So Allah wanted to replace him with someone who was better than him in goodness and obedience and the coolness of the eyes of the parents, whatever. So this was from the instruction of Allah. Now, I may never understand why that story is in the Quran the way it is, but I will extract as much as I can from it in terms of lesson. For me, the le one of the big lessons I learned from that story is when Allah knows that something will happen with this child later on, such that you won't be able to handle it, it would have just been a blessing that Allah took the child away while the memories were all still happy. But you didn't look at it as a blessing. But it was. It is. Okay, what guarantee do you have that that child was going to be a bad child? I have no guarantee. But I do know that when Allah took the child away, Allah took the child away at the best timing. It's a test for you also. Go through the sabr, you get Jannatul Firdaus. Look after your family who are perhaps disabled. And that is your paradise. But if you want to jump off the boat at that stage, you just lost out. Like some people, they have a child who is disabled. They give the child up for adoption. That's it. Go. Adoption. Why? You just jumped off the boat. Allah gave you a chance to earn paradise through serving your child who is perhaps challenged or disabled. And all you did is you jumped off the boat by giving the child away. That's it. I'm gone. I'm no more on this scene. Why? Because the child is disabled. Well, Allah says we gave you the chance to get paradise just by serving the child. You refused to do it. Well, you gave that opportunity to someone else. The child will still be looked after by another. And I want to give those who have these type of children a word that will be a word of goodness. Do you know that not only paradise, but even in this world, sometimes when Allah blesses you with such a challenged child, Allah opens other doors for you, many other doors. So your sustenance increased. Your business started doing well. You might, you might be struggling to actually look after your child, but some other things happened. It brought husband and wife closer together and you were not close, so close before that. Some other things happened. And this is why, read Surah Al-Sharh. What is Surah Al-Sharh? أَلَمْ نَشْرَحْ لَكَ صَدْرَكَ وَوَضَعْنَا عَنْكَ وِزْرَكَ الَّذِي أَنْقَضَ ظَهْرَكَ ورفعنا لك ذكرك فإن مع العسر يسرا إن مع العسر يسرا فإذا فرغت فانصب وإلى ربك فارغب Haven't we heard the surah so many times? It's repeated in salah and we know it off by heart when we were young we learnt it the problem is we did not go through its meaning that's the problem that's a hardship on its own I want to take from it two verses. Allah says, فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرًا إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرًا I've read a research just on these verses. A research. What was the research all about? Talking about the meaning of it. What exactly does it mean? And I've always preferred the translation of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. Beautiful. But let me give you Usrun in the Arabic language means hardship. And Yusrun means ease. So the, the difference is just an Ayn, Usr and Yusr. Usr means hardship and Yusr means ease. So the distance between hardship and ease is the distance between the Ayn and the Ya. That's it. After hardship, there has to be ease. When a person's terminally ill and they've passed away, what do people say? He's at peace now, right? He's no more suffering. That's a fact. He's at peace. It had to come. There was a breaking point at some stage. It had to come. Or they had to get cured. 
So that hardship and this ease, the relationship between the two, Allah says, indeed, with the hardship is ease. And he says it again. He didn't just say it once. He says, فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرًا So indeed, with hardship, with the hardship, there is ease. إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرًا He says it again. And indeed, with the hardship, there is ease. Those of you who know the Arabic language and those of you who are experts in what is called Nahu. Nahu is the linguistic rules and regulations of the Arabic language. Anyone who's an expert in that will tell you that these verses are amazing. They have deep meaning because Alif and Lam. Now I'm sure most of us would actually understand what that means. Alif, these are letters in the Arabic language. Alif and Lam. A, L, Al. That Al has so many meanings in Arabic. So many meanings. So when Allah says Al Usr, it means in English we just say the difficulty, the hardship. But that the in the Arabic language actually refers to something. Sometimes it's talking about all hardship, all hardship. It is called listighraq al-jins, that which actually includes everything of its kind. When you say an-nas, you are talking of all the people. So it's not the people, all the people. That's Arabic language. So in this verse, Allah said al-usr. It could mean all the difficulty, but the, the linguistic experts say, no, it's talking of the difficulty. Why? For a reason. Allah says, with the difficulty, there is ease. Sometimes that Alif and Lam actually refers to something specific that people know. Lil Ahd. It's called Al Ahd. Al Ahd means something you know about. I'm talking about, if I say, give me a book, you don't know the book. But if I say, give me the book, between you and me, you know which book I'm talking about. And if you don't, you'll say, which book? I'll say, the book. Say, which book? Then you give me the title of the book. I expected you to know because we are close. We were talking about a book. Now that we were talking about the book, I'm telling you, give me the book. Without batting an eyelid, you give me a specific book. The people watching know that between you and I, we were talking about some specific book. I used T-H-E to refer to a specific book. So in the Arabic language, when you said Al-Usr, you, you could be referring to something that people know about. But in that verse, in that context, Allah has not yet spoken about something. So when I say the book, people need to ask, well, what book? When I say the hardship, people might ask, what hardship? So Allah says, wait, he repeated the same verse again. Because when Allah said, with the hardship, there is ease. And then he said, inna ma'al usri yusran. And with the hardship, now which hardship are you talking about? The one we just spoke about now, there is ease. Which means with the same hardship, there are two points of ease. Wow, subhanallah. Now do you get what it means? فَإِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرًا Indeed, with the hardship, there is ease. إِنَّ مَعَ الْعُسْرِ يُسْرًا Indeed, with the same hardship we were talking about in the previous verse, there is another ease. Which means, if I add those two verses together, it means with every hardship, there are two points of ease. What are the two points of ease? One is Allah will create ease for you. Now, this is another tafsir. This is a third tafsir. Allah creates ease for you in the dunya. And Allah creates ease for you in the hereafter. It's included in the meaning. But I still prefer that which Abdullah ibn Abbas said. Radiallahu anhuma. He says, this verse is speaking about two points of ease with the same hardship. Subhanallah. And this gives me a lot of courage and a lot of encouragement. It actually boosts me in so many different ways. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. So those who are going through hardship, don't worry. Ya fari, ya sahib al hammi, inna al hamma mun fariju, abshir bi khayrin fa inna al farij allahu, ida bulita fa thik billahi warda bihi, inna al ladi yakshifu al balwa. 
Who Allah? Oh, you who is going through hardship, difficulty, worry, concern, don't worry. That worry is actually that concern, that hardship is going to go. It has to go. For indeed, the one who will cause it to go is Allah. Give, be a person who has glad tidings. Get the good news of goodness that is going to follow. For indeed, Allah will alleviate your suffering. Have hope in Allah. Don't lose hope in Allah. Keep on making dua a day, two days, three days. I know of someone who was in their 30s, mid 30s, not married, a female. And she was a person who said, I wanted to get married at 16. That's how forward I was looking to having a husband. Double that age, still not married. And I'm making dua from the age of 10, 12. Oh Allah, get me married. Oh Allah, get me married. Oh Allah, I want to get married. Make it easy for me. And it just didn't come. So there are some types of people, some lose hope, they stop making dua and that's it, they can't. And some continue making dua. They have hope. She says, when I was 36 years old, 36 years old, I got married to the prince of my dreams. Can happen. Subhanallah, you might have lost how many years? 20 years. But you still got prince of your dreams. Alhamdulillah, some of us stopped dreaming. Subhanallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us all the princes and the kings and the queens and the princesses of our spouses. Imagine if you had to refer to your spouse, how would you refer to your spouse? Anyone here would call their wife... Uh, Princess of my dreams. The men are just looking at each other. <laughs> What's going on? Subhanallah. I know one young man says, well, if you want me to call her the princess, I first need to be the prince, you know. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create ease. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all. Remember, the Quran is filled with beautiful verses. Read the words of Allah. They will bring comfort to the heart. Read the words of Allah. Read the life of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It will help you through any hardship, through every hardship. Read his lifestyle, his biography. Go through the stories of the prophets. Go through the stories of the companions. See what you learn. It will help you through your difficulty. If you increase your dhikr, the remembrance of Allah, Allah says, indeed, it is with the remembrance of Allah that the hearts become calm. The hearts are collected, calmed down. So remember Allah often. Turn to Allah. For indeed, He is the one who will help you.